Dominique and Cindy Doobie. I actually met them a few months back in the, in the fall and I went out for a tasting to taste their chocolates and desserts. Thinking I'd be there for half an hour, I was there for three hours. It was amazing. I learned so much about what they have to offer and tasted a lot of a lot of sweets and, and things and, and I tasted them really for the week on, week on. But I learned so much just from them just to know what they do in their business and how they've come to be world award winning, you know, award winning people for, for their chocolates. They've won many uh, awards throughout the world now for all the chocolates they do. And I think you do that by being precise and obviously they have a plan and, uh, and it's working for them. So uh, let me introduce uh, Cindy and Dominique and they'll tell you their story. Thank you. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is actually show you a little bit of uh, example. So it's a more of a multi-visual uh, experience at least, but not necessarily with the uh, camera and everything else. So first and foremost, I think that being an expert, you have to be, or, or to look at perfectionism, you have to be an expert in your field. And for what we do, I just, if you, some of you don't know um, us uh, personally or otherwise, I can give you a little brief synopsis of uh, some of the things that have made us expert in our field. Um, so Cindy will put up, we uh, were voted uh, <laughs> so if you don't know what we look like. <laughs> Uh, best chocolate in America for uh, three years in a row. Uh, then in 2015 for this year. But you can turn it the other way. The, uh, we uh, wrote uh, five cookbooks. Two of them, the first one that we wrote, Wild Sweets, uh, Exotic Dessert and One Pairing, and uh, Wild Sweets Chocolate. Both of them were forwarded by Charlie Trotter in Chicago, and both of them won best cookbook in the world. One in Spain, and one in uh, London, England. All right, that's okay. There's more to come, so. Um, actually, maybe show the other one before. This one here, we were, um, we entered uh, many uh, culinary competitions around the world from around 1980 to 1999. And we went all over Manila in, the, in uh, the World Culinary Olympics in Germany, the uh, World Culinary Cup in uh, uh, Luxembourg, the Culinary Classic in Basel, and many of the other ones. We won gold medal just about in every one of them. And we were selected as Team BC, then Team Canada, uh, Culinary Team Canada. Then in uh, 2000 to 2004, we were selected as a national pastry team for um, the World Pastry Cup <laughs> in Lyon, France. And we represented Canada twice in 2001 and 2003. And both of the, uh, the shows were filmed as documentaries on the Food Network. So you could see that uh, it was pretty hard. And one that we entered the World Pastry Team Championship, we started the trend of breaking show pieces and everyone really liking it. No. Yes. Um, through all of the different events and achievements that we had, we were the only Canadian pastry chef ever invited to the Masters of Food and Wine in Carmel, California. It's a, an event that basically only Michelin three stars, the PhD of sort of the culinary world. And it ran for 20 years. And the only other two Canadian chefs that were ever invited was Susur Lee from uh, Toronto and David Huxworth here from Vancouver. And um, the, um, the last one, some of the other events as well too, and that's where we met Charlie. Uh, Trotter, it was at the World Gourmet Summit and uh, Singapore and some of the other major pastry people that we highlight or we really like for their style was Pierre May and a few of the other ones as well were, were there too. So that's um, a little bit of um, who we are and what we've done. Now the part that we wanted to show you is to us when you eat chocolate it should be as much or desserts in general it should be as much as possible a multi-sensory experience. So we'll take you a little bit into the journey of how we go about that, that aspect of it. So it's the first, you're gonna do the, uh, the taste. So we do a lot of work with the University of British Columbia. Every year we submit at least four to, we, uh, yeah, about one, sometimes two. They give us four to six undergraduate students and we do, we submit them a, a research project and we study with them, we we'll work with them for that year. At the end of the year, we get the result and we try to implement them as much as we can. One of the projects that we did, which is part of what we, as far as perfectionism is, a filling inside of a chocolate, most of them are a ganache or an emulsion. So we wanted to understand how can we make an emulsion to be the best way possible. So an emulsion basically is a liquid and a fat and you have to combine them together into a homogeneous uh, solution or, or base. So we looked into different ways of the, the best way of actually emulsifying chocolate is the temperature to be around 35 to 40 degrees Celsius for the cocoa to emulsify with the cream. 
So what one way to do that, or we, one of the ways we just try to do that is actually to put them into a vacuum bag, have a thermal circulator, and then you can actually submerge the, the, both of the, 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 all of the components you're gonna make the ganache with at 35 to 40 degrees. So you have constant temperature and you have it always at that temperature, you don't go any higher. You can also retain a lot of the aromas because you're in a sealed bag. Then it's very difficult in order to try to make an emulsion when it's inside the bag. So we look at different ways. For example, we use uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound bath, when you think of when you go to the airport or some of the airline caterings, they have those machines that shake the water and basically takes all the particles and food from the, from the spoons or forks or whatever. Then that's actually what it does. The ultrasound shakes the particles within the bag and you can create an emulsion by using it that way. Unfortunately, it's not very practical, so it's a, a, an exercise of finding out whether a can or cannot work. But one of the things that we did find that works very well is actually using um, tissue homogenizer. And that way you can rotate to about 20 to 24,000 RPM, and that's one of the ways you can get the best chocolate emulsion. You can actually do it as well too with uh, a regular um, uh, immersion blender, and it works really well too. So, the, um, another part of it, uh, that, of what we do, is the taste part is that we're one of the few companies in the world that actually um, are based, a science based as far as the cocoa, making our own chocolate for cocoa bean to bar. What we wanted to do is to make sure that in order to set yourself apart from what the other people are doing, if you buy a chocolate from a, from a company, it's always going to be the same. So you can buy Barona, Cocoa Berry, or whatever, and they're all great chocolate, and they all do a very good result. But if you want to stand out and be perfect and have your own distinct product, the only way you can do that is by having chocolate, because your own chocolate. So here we Basically, we set up a lab where we have all of the steps on a micro basis. So same thing as it would be done into a large company, but reduced to a tiny, tiny little shop. <laughs> so we buy the cocoa beans, so that would be the number one. Then we roast them, and then the beans are winnowed. So they basically you remove the shell. The shell is edible, but it doesn't taste very good when you make the chocolate product. Then it's crushed into a little particles. Then it goes into a machine which is called a, um, a Contro 4-in-1 refiner and it's kind of like a paddle bowl that is water jacketed and what it does is that it heats up the cocoa butter and it, it releases the cocoa powder part of the chocolate and then it emulsifies. That takes about 24 hours. Then we bring it up and that, that would be the number four and that's actually a cocoa liqueur. The cocoa liqueur is just, that's the name of it, it has 100% cocoa nothing else. We add in chocolate, uh, sorry, uh, sugar cane sugar, cocoa butter, some uh, vanilla, and maybe milk product if we're making milk chocolate. And that goes into a conch. It's a, basically, it's a stone grinding machine and it rotates for about 48 hours. Then you get the chocolate. But in order to get the flavor to develop, it takes about 48, what, well, the conching takes about 48 hours. Then we let it age for about a month. And then after that, we temper it or add different flavor products or whatever, and then you get a chocolate bar. One of the, um, um, I'm going to really quick because we have a time, so I want to show you a Seven little bit. Minutes. Seven minutes. So one of the other things that we wanted to do as well too when we create a visual experience is that most of the time if you have a, a product and you see um, as, a, as a professional chef, if you wanted to do something for Mother's Day for example, you would buy a polycarbonate mold that were already made by a company and then it would have a shape, a heart, and maybe a different shape, whatever, whatever is available on the market. But everybody else would be using the same kind of mold. So we want to create experiences visually that are very unique and only us make our own product. So what we do is we uh, create our own molds where we make them out of uh, clay or, or um, other kind of material. And then we sand them and grind them and make them into the shape of what we want. Then we create masters out of uh, silicone so that we can use these to cast the chocolate into each one of the product. And then whatever it is that we do, so for Mother's Day, for example, we would have a little casting which would be made from here and it will turn into a chocolate that way. The, um, another part of the, uh, the visual aspect would be the, uh, the presentation. Uh, when we wrote uh, the books, the first book that we wrote, the, we had uh, a photographer, we hired a photographer to do the, the photography, but it cost a lot of money, and if you want to do more books, uh, publishers don't want to pay more than, than a set, set amount, so we had to, well, we decided we were going to learn how to make it, because we think that the food styling is actually the most important part. We design the food, we style it, so the only thing that the photographer does is shoot it. So we, we learned it, and we, all the other books from then on, we did ourselves. So what we wanted to do is to, um, um, in the book, 
we created um, different types of micro scenes. And this is one of the things that we do now as part of our design for our packaging. This one here is actually a shot that we did with a, it's a tiny little shot glass, like maybe about an ounce or so. And we use different types of hydrocolloids and emulsified water. And then we shut it inside of the dark using different types of gels so that we can create different colors within the, the, the packaging. I'm mean, sorry, within the, the shot, the composition of the shot. And then we have um, one of the few companies as well too that work, uh, has a graphic artist working with us uh, on a regular basis. And we told her we wanted to do something that was really more unique and different as far as a chocolate box. So she, the idea that we wanted was something like more like a graffiti. So we created the shot and then she created an artwork that placed it on top and now we print and then actually put that on. But we also do our own art. So we put them in, we frame them and we put them into uh, artwork that we do the same way so that we can always kind of make a connection between every piece of the work that we do. Um, some, the, the texture maybe, so it'll be the last one. So it's okay, we're a couple minutes over. <laughs> The, um, one of the other aspects that we do is um, texture. As soon as you put something inside of your mouth, an emulsion is smooth and silky, but you also want to have something that has a lot of texture, so stimulate the auditory. The, this part here, we wanted to do a lot of research on, again, you can buy nuts and other kind of products that will create a lot of texture, but then everybody else can do it. So we want to find something else that was more unique and different. So we did wild rice. Then these are, we did some of the research on uh, mushroom conservation. And these are special bags that you can put into a um, uh, pressure cooker. So they will stand temperature 125 degrees Celsius and they have a little HEPA filter. Then you put a, a, a plug. And basically the idea or the advantage of this is you can put the same, the exact amount of water that you want for it to swell up and absorb exactly what you need as far as moisture within the product. So you don't have to over dry it. Then, in order to get that crunch, you can put it like in a popcorn machine or things like that, but it's very uh, small and the production is very limited. So we have in the lab uh, what is called a vacuum drying microwave. It basically is a machine that will heat up the product and remove the moisture through, vac through uh, the heat of the microwave and it's stuck through a pump on the outside. So as the moisture comes off the product, then it starts to ex expel or swell and then it becomes extremely crunchy. We do that also with olives. So we take olives and we, we poach them into a spice syrup and then we put them into the vacuum. And it, if you put them in a dehydrator, they're always going to be uh, chewy. But if you put them in a vacuum dryer, they'll be like candy. They're super crunchy. So those are some of the other things as well too. Again, for a multi-sensor um, experience. So I'm already two minutes over from, uh, from my time here. Um, but, Don't uh, toggle. Yeah, okay, so okay. <laughs> that will be uh, our presentation, part of the presentation for this evening. Thank you.